Today we're going to talk about Michelson interferometer and Fourier transform spectroscopy. So this is a sodium lamp. It's the same kind of lamp that's in street lights or in some gyms. Uh, I'll turn it on in a little bit and let it warm up. Uh, the main emission of sodium, this sort of yellow orangish glow, is actually two spectral lines that are very close to each other and less expensive spectrometers aren't able to resolve those two lines, but I'll show you a technique where, where we can accurately measure the distance in, in wavelengths between those two lines. So let me turn on the light and let it heat up. So one, one thing about the sodium lamp is when, it, when you first turn it on and the electricity starts to flow through, you see this pinkish glow, and that's the pinkish glow is characteristic of helium. So there's a little bit of helium in there just to get it started. The sodium has all condensed on these filaments. And that's the orange glow you might see at the top. Uh, the filaments are heating up, and as it heats up, the sodium evaporates from those filaments, and eventually it fills the whole tube, and it will glow orange. It will be extremely bright, and we're going to have to put this in a box, because otherwise it's painful to watch. So because there are other gases in here, like helium, and because sodium has other emission lines, there's a filter here that just filters out only that yellow sodium glow. Let me see if I can put the filter over here. It should sort of look maybe a little bit yellow. Everything should turn a little bit yellow. Um, so we're only going to let the, the two emission lines from sodium through this filter and then into this interferometer. And here there's a half silver mirror. So when the sodium light hits, half of the light goes one way, half of the light goes the other way. This the light that goes this way hits this movable mirror, which we can adjust by turning this knob with the micrometer. This is what we'll use to take the spectra. That comes back through the mirror, and some of it bounces back into the lamp, which we don't care about. Some of it goes into the camera or onto a screen, which we will look at. Uh, the other half go goes this way. This is just a piece of glass that's the same thickness as this mirror. And the reason for this piece of glass, I'll discuss more in the next parts of this video. After it goes through this piece of clear piece of glass, it hits this mirror. And this mirror is fixed in position, but I can adjust its angle. And the idea here is I can adjust the, the tip and the tilt of this mirror so that looking into this interferometer, the image of the sodium lamp off of this mirror and the image off of this mirror align with each other. And when you get that alignment, you, you can get the possibility of constructive and destructive interference. And the experiment involves just turning this knob and watching the interference pattern and measuring various aspects of this interference pattern. So I'll, I'll stop now and let the lamp continue to warm up. All right, so now I have, um, I put the sodium lamp in, in a box because it's very bright. I'm only letting out a little bit through this frosted piece of glass. Still going through the filter and the interferometer. On my other camera, I have I'm just looking straight into it. This is sort of what you would see if you were just staring into the interferometer. And let me adjust the angle to align the two images and see if we can get some interference fringes. So there we go. See some fringes. Um, it's a little bit harder on the camera to get everything in focus. But there's the bullseye pattern isn't quite centered, but you can see definite bright and dark streaks. Now, if I were to turn the knob that controls the distance, I go very slowly. You can see fringes go by. So here I'm trying to turn it wavelengths of light, which is very difficult. So even if I just tap it, some fringes go by. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it a bit more, and you'll see these fringes sort of fade out into nothingness. And as I turn it even more, they come back. They're quite contrasty. I'm sort of turning and letting go, turning and letting go. So here's a point of maximum contrast. And I keep going. Still, oh, maybe that wasn't the maximum contrast. Even better. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And then they'll fade. And there's now here we're pretty close to the point of minimum contrast, and I'll go more and more and more. 
you'll see maximum contrast. So what's happening here is that when we're near a point of maximum contrast, the fringes you see are where the two spectral lines have their peaks and troughs both lining up. And, and so you get uh, constructive interference for both of the two spectral lines. As I turn this more, and uh, because the wavelengths are slightly different, the constructive points of interference for one of the spectral lines are not going to be at the same locations as the constructive interference for the other spectral line. And eventually, I'll turn it to a point where uh, the constructive interference for one spectral line is exactly where the destructive interference is for the other one. And that's where the, the contrast goes away. And by drawing the right pictures and working out the right trigonometry, you can verify that uh, this tells you something about the separation of the two wavelengths in the spectral lines. And so the data I'm going to take and the data I'm going to give you is I will turn this to be probably at a contrast minima, because those are generally more accurate to pick out. I'll make a measurement. I'll record that measurement. And I will turn it to the next minima. And I'll do that several times for several minima. And then I'll go back to the beginning and start over again. And I'll, I'll report all the locations where I detected the minimum amount of contrast. Now, the contrast isn't going to go away completely unless spectral lines are exactly the same brightness. They're pretty close, but uh, they're not exactly the same. All right, so now I've switched lamps. We have a mercury lamp. Um, this is a high-pressure mercury lamp. And unlike sodium, mercury only has one spectral line. But because of the high pressure inside of the mercury lamp, the spectral line is broadened. And we can use the Fourier transform technique with this Michelson interferometer to work out the width of that spectral line. So let me put a diffuser in front of the lamp just to make the pattern a little bit more evident. And here on the micrometer, I'm reading about four, four and a half millimeters out. And as I turn the micrometer out, for a while you don't really see much. I'm going in some steps of maybe uh, going in steps of 50 microns or so. So eventually, I will turn it, and you will start to see fringes. There you go. And as I get closer and closer to equal path length, the interference from the entire width of that uh, mercury spectrum should have peaks and troughs in roughly the same place. So here, the fringes are getting more and more contrasty. More and more contrasty. And now I'm pretty close to equal path length here. And now they're getting less and less contrasty as I add a little bit more and more and more distance. So I've passed through the region of equal path length. And now the one I'm turning is, is longer than the path length for the one I'm not turning. And by taking very careful data, uh, measuring the contrast, measuring the difference between minimum and maxima, at many, many locations, you can map out the shape of how, uh, how contrasty the fringes are as a function of position. And the Fourier transform of that is the width of the spectral line that is being emitted by the mercury. All right, so now we're back in the, in the other room with similar Michelson interferometer. And here we're going to try to see interference of white light. And to do that, we are starting with a mercury lamp. It's a low pressure mercury lamp. Because the pressure is lower, the spectral line is narrower. And so we're able to see interference over a much wider area. And so this, this makes it easier to align. So I've already aligned the tip and tilt of this mirror by looking at some lettering and, and aligning the letters. When everything is perfectly aligned, that gives us a bullseye pattern. And you can see as I'm talking, the fringes are moving around because things are very sensitive when uh, you're talking about vibrations on the scale of wavelengths of light. And as I turn this, this knob to move the arms uh, of the interferometer, you can see fringes go by. 
And as I turn them more and more and more, the fringes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, the bullseye will start to take up most of the screen, at which point I'm, I know I'm getting close to equal path length. And so since I know I'm getting close, I will now switch to a white light source that is filtered with a narrow filter. Okay, so now I've switched from the mercury lamp to a white light with a narrow 10 nanometer bandpass filter, and the fringes are gone. So we're still outside of the range where this, where the path lengths are similar enough that the peaks and troughs on either side of this 10 nanometer bandpass can both constructively or both destructively interfere. So now let me turn the knob again and see if we can see some fringes with filtered white light. Oh, there we go. So now you see a little bit of flickering. Those are uh, interference fringes. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to switch from this 10 nanometer bandpass to a wider bandpass, which allows for a region of interference that's even smaller. So here's a 27 nanometer bandpass filter. And again, the fringes, the flickering is gone because uh, our path lengths aren't narrow enough. Now I'm going to turn the knob even more gently. Oh, hey, look at that. So now we're seeing some flickering. So I must be very close with this wide bandwidth bandpass filter. So let me take that out. Let me just look at the white light itself. And the camera is, uh, is auto compensating a little bit. But you can see that there are some flickers, some fringes, with just the white light. Let me just turn the knob a tiny little bit. Oh, and there we've lost it. So wherever I was, I was, uh, I was right on the equal path length. Let me back up a little bit, see if I can approach that again. I'll put in the, the wider 27 nanometer bandpass filter and turn. Wait, let me back up and uh, shoot for it again. Retreating to the narrow bandpass filter where the fringe should be easier to see. Okay, so now I'm back with the narrow 10 nanometer filter and I've managed to get fringes and when I take this out, I see a little bit of flickering with the white light. You see different colors flash by. So this means that I, I happen to land right on the spot where I'm getting white light interference fringes. Let me tilt the mirror a little bit and let's just see if we can get, get some other patterns. Yeah, there we go. So there's a lot of different colors are flashing by. So this is interference of white light with itself as I slowly adjust the angle of the mirrors a little bit. So here is uh, here's another view of the white light fringes. I moved the camera, changed the focus a little bit. Here you can actually see the interference stripes. So if, I, if I clap, they do crazy things. I can adjust the mirrors a little bit, although I'm, I'm hesitant to do too much. Let me turn the, turn the knob just a tiny little bit. You can see some of these fringes going by. And there, oops, there they've disappeared. So I've already, already gone out of the range where I'm seeing white light interference. Uh, there we go. By tilting the mirror a little bit, you see some stripes. I tilt the mirror a little bit more. Stripes go away. So there's maybe a few, a few stripes, a few wavelengths where you see interference. And if I got rid of the color view, if I just made this black and white, there would be even fewer because the color filters are narrower band than the, a black and white camera would be, or adding all three colors together.